Okay. So, um, what I, what I, as I said, what we'll be going through is sort of the end-to-end -end life or the end-to-end -end journey of an angel investor. Um, and I'm hoping that you'll pick up things you did hadn't picked up before, or maybe even new things that we haven't discussed uh, up till now. And as I said, uh, you know, we start with startups, which is what angels invest in. And really, the, the key differentiators of what makes a startup a startup, apart from the fact that they, they are building in extreme uncertainty with and trying to build that innovative solution, is the fact that, first of all, the way they think about growth is different. Uh, the expectation is there will be rapid growth that sets in. And I've invested in startups that have become SMEs simply because they couldn't get the growth. Okay. The second is their relationship with funding. People like us exist to invest in startups, not in SMEs or traditional, um, bring your business plan and let me bank it um, type businesses. And the third and final is that right from the beginning, anytime they're taking money, they have to consider exits. So when you're putting your money in as an angel, you're trying to think, can I get it back in five years or is it going to take me seven years? It is the angel mentality. VC is exactly the same. And it is that coming back of the money, which is the exit, that actually focuses the mind in terms of progress towards it. Um, Paul Graham says 5 to 7% per week in the initial stages. I say 10 to 20% month on month is what we're looking at on the continent. 5 to 7% per week is highly unrealistic on, on the African continent. Uh, the American environment is, so, is different from ours in that respect. Having said that, um, I think uh, Flutterwave uh, managed to get to these kind of metrics, but uh, it's the only one I'm aware of that has grown or that had that has had that kind of uh, explosive growth. Um, so that's really trying to describe the animal, and you can see the startups go through uh, levels of funding. We're still going to dig deeper into that, but essentially they start with an incubation. Uh, whether it's of their own volition or through a hub or a startup, but the whole idea there is to get what is called a minimum viable product, which is the first set of customers. That is what qualifies them for startup status. And really the focus of a startup is getting that consistent customer base that defines what we call product market fit. Once they've found that and they've got a consistent uh, customer base that is growing, their target has to be break even. From break even, it's can we now keep, do the growth we got to get to break even, can we now do that post profit uh, with, with traction and get to unit profitability? And those are really the steps. By the time they are unit profitable, they're, they're way out of angel territory. And you're just sitting there, you know, waiting for your exit if you haven't got it already. And that's why really don't worry about the self-funding pre-exit IPO series C type um, uh, exits. Typically angels will come out at series A. Um, some will stay to series B, but typically the target is to get your startup to series A so that you can cash out. Um, alternatively, there, and as is in the case of um, we're finding uh, acquisitions do occur even pre-Series A, but um, that, can, that can be you get a ZB type uh, story, but we'll, we'll talk about those. Now, I've talked to you about um, David's five startup truths, and I can't but help, you know, I enjoy bringing it up because first and foremost is the fact that startups fail. There's no... And there's no guarantee by anybody that this one or banker for sure is not going to fail. We've seen startups that have been overfunded fail. We've seen startups that have bootstrapped themselves fail. We've seen startups in Lagos fail. We've seen startups in Port Harcourt fail. We've seen startups in New York fail. Um, the thing is, nobody knows which startup is not going to fail. And therefore, because of those first two points, 
investing in startups is really, really a numbers game. Okay. If you're coming into this thinking you're going to do one or two transactions and you make your money, then I have news for you. It's the wrong place to be. You start at 20 and then you move up and then you start to get, you know, the, the kind of rewards. Now, what David means by what went, what ends up usually went down first, as you're all aware by now, is actually the value of death. And typically startups go into it bleeding red all the way. And it is at that break, getting towards the break even point that angels really want to play. And even when they're getting to later stages, startups will always need more money. There's no, ain't no about it, doubt it. What you can do is plan how many rounds you want to go with this startup with. Okay, I'll go with them three rounds, or I'll go with them two, or I'll go with them five. Okay, you decide, um, realizing that if they get it right, each round, each subsequent round will be pricier than the, than the previous one. So if at the first one you bought 10 shares for $10, then your expectation rightfully should be at the next round, you're buying 10 shares for about $15. And the subsequent round, you're buying 10 shares for $20. That is telling you that your valuation is going up and that's really where you want to be. Right. We talked about the stages. Well, the key thing about this that I want to emphasize is the fact that before they're making money, whether you like it or not, you're betting on the founding team because they don't have a product. You're just looking and saying, do you believe that this team can actually deliver on the goods and make what it is they're talking about? At seed stage, well, you're actually betting on the product or service. So they've got an MVP, it is working, and they've got it, you know, to where the customers actually believe in it. Growth stage, the bets on traction. Do you believe that they're gonna scale post profitability like the way they're doing? By the time you're betting on unit economics, it's not really angel, angel territory. That's VC and private equity. Right. This is one of the things I wanted to sort of, um, uh, how do I put it? I wanted to discuss this evening because um, I spent a fair bit of time with, uh, with my syndicate this week, sort of sharing my investment thesis for the syndicate. And it was quite fascinating listening to the feedback as to how people you know, were approaching, approaching this. Uh, two people actually came back after and said, oh, I didn't know that we needed a thesis for investing. Well, the thing is, you have to have a reason for being. Why are you doing this? And you've got to be very, very, very clear because it helps you as an investor. Look, in any given, you, you, Okay, let me think. Uche is the only person that's not in the syndicate um, group. But you must have noticed every week I'm throwing a new offer into the group now. If you don't have a basis for evaluating, which is your thesis, then you, know, you might as well not be betting. Okay, because you've got to answer questions like, you know, how should any startup fit in my portfolio? Remember we talked, you have, you have to have a portfolio. Okay, so for example, in my case, I'm looking at, you know, media companies that can complement Big Cabal. I'm looking for edutech companies that can mix with the FlexiSouth value chain. But by and large, all of them are technology-enabled innovations. What kind of growth opportunities are you looking for, okay, after you've invested? What kind of mentoring or advisory do you want to provide? Okay, if you look back five years from now, what would you like the performance to have been? How about exit risks? We've just talked about the fact that most of them fail. But even the ones that don't fail, before you can get somebody to buy them or for a VC to take you out in Series A, it takes time. What's your attitude towards that? Are you looking at things that are going to mature in three years to five years or five years to seven years? Or are you prepared, like I had to do with Striker? Um, my final exit came at 18 years. So yes, it's good at 100x, but do you really want to wait that long? And 
how much are you prepared to invest? Is it 2,500 max for a ticket? Is it a grand? Is it 1,500? Is it 10K? How much do you have realizing there's, there's always follow on? So these are critical things you need to consider. What industry are you from? Which ones do you like? What stage are you going to do ideation or are you just going to wait like I now do for post revenue? So these are all the things you need to consider, but most importantly, you then need to write them down. They need to be articulated first and foremost as a theme. What is your thematic? In my case is technology enabled innovation. If I don't see technology enabled innovation, it's probably not going to fly. Then underneath that, what are the segments or the industries that you are critically considering? I like essentials. So right now I'm looking for agri-tech, okay? Because I think agri-tech is going to be the business. At the same time, I love renewables, green tech. Oh, surprise, surprise. That's the name of the company I now work with. Um, but if you know me at all, you know that edutech is really, really my sweet spot. That's what I love the most. Then what kind of models are you looking at? Will you do B2B or do you, are you looking for B2C or are you looking for B2B2C or are you looking at those that even do B2G, which is government? So you've got to think through all of these things and come up with a concrete idea of where you want to be at the minimum five years out after you've done a number of transactions to build your portfolio. And that is, those are the elements that should go into your investment thesis so that you can go back to it. And, you know, oh, my criteria are, uh, you must have a team. Sorry, you're a single founder, no vexed. My criteria are, well, you must have at least 5 million Naira's worth of revenue at, uh, within a year of coming out of uh, MVP and launch. Uh, you've been around for two years. You guys are still at 2 million. I'm sorry, it doesn't fit. So again, it gives you the basis for evaluation. And that, uh, this is one of the key things I'm not quite sure that I've actually shared with this group. And, I, and that's why I wanted to spend a fair bit of time on it. And when we get into Q&A, I will expect, you know, um, uh, some questions on it. Right, you know, you know how you start sourcing deal flow. Now, um, I, I no longer just use the traditional sourcing deal flow. Um, I start with mentoring. If I can't mentor them, then they, that means they're not teachable. They don't even meet my criteria. Forget that matter. Ain't happening. By the time I've mentored you for a year, if I haven't identified an investment worthy startup that I can provide advisory to, I let you go. But if I have, then we spend anywhere from six months to another year together, getting you what I call investment ready. And it is that investment readiness right now that's consuming most of my time because on average, I'm spending 10 to 15 hours a week with you know, my portfolio uh, people. But once that's done, it then gets to where I can share it with my syndicate, uh, I can share it with the network. I can share it with VCs and other people knowing that, yes, the work's gone in and these guys have that potential. Where do I source from? I have a very, very strong relationship with hubs, incubators, and accelerators. I don't even wait for their demo days anymore. I am a mentor to most of them from Founders Institute, Impact Hub, Ventures Platform, you name it. There's a whole host of them that I'm constantly seeing i'm running programs for the likes of arm running programs for lagos state running programs um, to identify different types of startups and through that process of course i identify investable startups and that's how i source plus like i shared with uh, some of you earlier today i do speak a lot maybe i should shut up sometimes but i speak at a lot of events where they are either funding events or startup events. Um, and so I've sort of become a go-to person. I'm an advisor to VC for Africa. I'm an advisor to TechPoint. I'm on the board of Tech Cabal. These are all online magnets for startups. Um, and that's really what you want to be doing is 
is make sure that you are that magnet so that you can select which ones you really want to work with and which ones you don't. It also means I get the opportunity from time to time to sit down like I am doing tomorrow morning with someone like Ilya Boyeji. Okay, we're spending an hour together tomorrow morning to go through what he's seeing, what I'm seeing. Um, tomorrow evening, it's Olumide Shoyombo. You guys may not know him. Olumide has got a portfolio of about 50 startups. Name, on, name only of the big startups that have come out of Nigeria. Chances are Olumide is one of uh, their very early stage. And I'm talking early stage before they went to anybody else is one of their investors. So I'm learning from people also how to do this properly. I'm not just taking it for granted that I have all the answers. And that's what I'm strongly suggesting you also imbibe yourselves. Then when it comes to assessing, you've now, you know, got this pool of entrepreneurs. What are you looking for? I cannot overemphasize it. If they don't have integrity and they can't show passion, forget it, it ain't gonna work. I've looked at Paystack, Flutterway, Vandella. I've looked at Paga, you name it. Every single one of the guys that ran that thing to the limit had integrity. Their yes was yes, their no was no. They say they're going to do it, they will do it. If they say they don't, they're not going to do it, they're not going to do it. That was the trademark. And they had a passion for what they were doing because they believed in the vision they were executing to. Startup experience counts. No matter how little, but the fact that during startup, at the very beginning, everybody has to do everything and you have to manage it that way and then slowly progress to where there's structures. And then people who all of us who had responsibility for five areas end up having it for two and then end up having it for one. And then even that one, you now split. Managing that, okay, is not something you learn at MBA in Harvard. It comes purely from experience. So... Yes, uh, the, the first timers can learn it, but if truth be told, I like to see people that have failed at it before and learn from that. It's one of the, the, the questions I ask. Domain expertise is important. Never underestimate it. Um, there's, there's a deal going around now um, in Technovision. It's to do with, um, it's, it's a FinTech, and one of the questions that came is, you know, you guys don't have, I don't see a banker in the midst of you. Um, and CBN does require actually five years minimum experience in the financial industry with a whole bunch of licensing. Their response was they're actually getting a CFO who has, okay, the prerequisite skills and everything else, but you must ask and you, they must have it. Okay, operating skills, don't underestimate it. Um, if you've never fired somebody before, it's non-trivial when you have to do it the first time and it can traumatize you if you do it wrongly. And having emotional intelligence as a leader, fundamentally important. I cannot overemphasize, you know, how important that is because it aligns with something my syndicate were added to the thesis um, uh, this last week it was actually, which is teachability or as I prefer to call it, coachability because teachability sounds like a teacher and somebody has to learn it's actually about coaching people to achieve um, that is something that is very very important commitment to the venture i don't like part-time founders i'm sorry you know i've come to that conclusion if they can't be bothered to spend all their time on this that means they don't have the long-term vision to deliver it i know people tell me ah but the uber guys uh, didn't uh, did it. They started at part-time and they went somebody to manage and all of that. I'm sorry. Yes, it worked for Uber. I don't see it working in the groups that are of, of companies that I have had the privilege of investing in. It takes a dedicated leadership to bring any long-term vision to life. They have to be realistic and pragmatic. Anybody telling you, oh, we're going to triple our, our revenue immediately after we get MVP and we're, you know, and we're going to float on water and do, you know, walk they have to be pragmatic i realize first of all you're dealing in an environment where electricity <laughs> if you get up to 12 hours electricity a day anywhere in nigeria you're living a luxury life that's the first thing pipe bone water uncle how about transportation challenges i could go on and on it's about being pragmatic about how your product or services are going to fit into that environment and the flexibility to be able to accommodate change as it occurs to you 
Um, even temperament, some people say is counter, counter, uh, counter productive or uh, the antithesis or the opposite of having passion. I don't think so. Okay. Doc is one of the most even tempered people I've ever met. But when he gets, when he talks passionately, you know, dude, this guy really loves this tech enablement. So um, that's what you're really, really looking for is somebody who can, when required, show passion, but is not really going to react to anything and everything. Most importantly, execution track record, not necessarily a startup, but people who can tell you, well, when I joined ABC, my target was to do this and to do that. And then unfortunately this didn't happen, but I did this instead. And then this happened. And then I did that. People who have that thinking of knowing how to influence outcomes and deliver in spite of challenges, those are the kind of people that you're looking for. I, I get asked young or old, it's not about young or old, it's about personality, integrity, passion, all the things I've list, listed out there, okay? Um, serial entrepreneurs or first timers, I prefer serial entrepreneurs, but first timers that are bright and coachable with these, with these uh, traits, I'll take a bet on them any day. Being tech savvy, okay, now, what it means to be tech savvy is different to different people, but let me put it this way. For me, it is about the person that understands what tech can do. Not people that can do with tech, but people that know this is what tech can do. Because you will find somebody that can do it with tech for you. Once you know what it is, tech can do for you. And in terms of education, I know they say education doesn't matter, but me, I found it, especially in Nigeria, okay? If you cannot stay the course and get a degree, the chances that you will stay and deliver a vision, hmm, oh boy. There are exceptions, of course, but by and large, you know, this is really, you know, uh, my take on it. Now, in terms of a weak entrepreneur, I think I've highlighted that, you know, uh, or realistic assessments. And if they lack any of the traits I mentioned earlier in terms of greatness, then chances are, they're not gonna deliver on the promise that you're looking for. So that is how, okay, uh, I tend to assess entrepreneurs. Now, that's the entrepreneur. What about their proposition? Well, when you're listening to the pitch, you really, really, again, remember I told you about starting with the portfolio thesis, you've got to look at it within the context of that, okay? Does it make sense to what I am trying to do with my portfolio? Is this, so for example, is it tech enabled, yes or no? Um, is it in the right industry yet or no? What is the size of the opportunity? Is it Nigeria only or is it Pan-African potential? Uh, the product or service itself, is this something I can resonate with? Okay, um, how strong is the founding team? These are critical questions you've got to write right from the beginning. And of course, where's the money going, you know? <laughs> Is it to attract customer, more customers? Okay, what are their folding alternatives? If I don't give them money, will they die? If the answer is yes, then chances are I won't give them money. How are they going to execute? So if it's attracting more customers, how are they going to do it? If it's building a better product, how are they planning to do it? And how do I get my money back? When I give it to them in 2020, how do I get it back in 2025 or in 2027? What's going to happen in 2023 that's going to let me know that, yes, my money is coming back in 2025? Then the pitch materials itself speaks volumes, how much effort they put into it, okay? Do they have online content you can reference? Is there written, proper written documentation? And what's the presentation itself like? How deep are their financials? Do they have assumptions underlying the forecasts that they're sharing with you? Have they... Have they we, we tested what the forecasts are. Have they got a high, medium, or low on their financials, for example? Then other things that, you know, um, are important and you might want to consider are things like, how are they going to get this sold? Is it all uh, digital media? What stage are they? Do they already have a product? Do they have customers? How big is the investment round? Like I tell everybody now knows, and I keep helping it, if you're looking for more than half a million, don't call TD, you're wasting your time, okay? Half a million, me, we're still waiting. But if you're looking for 50K, 100K, 
up to 250 please i beg let me let me you know if you meet all those criteria let's have a chat and take that take it into consideration what they're going to need to get to where they're beyond you at the half a million is it one round to get to where they need that kind of money or is it two rounds and why is that because i've got all my vc friends sitting down now waiting for me okay there's zach george who is in uh, launch africa there's uh Boy, G future africa there's uh uh what's his name cfa there are whole hosts up to tokumbo tokumbo ishmael in alicia capital uh for labia so in that level there's a whole bunch of people out there who are waiting to take this off my hands if they do the things i've said uh before in terms of future financing what's the quality of the business plan and presentation location is very important uh until last week me i was lagos only but now i'm because of covid and all of that I'm pan-Nigerian. And the type of industry, like I said earlier, you know, does it meet your portfolio? Uh, my friend, DS, only does people that make things. If they don't make something, he's not interested. Um, I do tech-enabled. So if it is not agri-tech, fintech, edutech, you're probably wasting your time talking to me. So those are the considerations when you're assessing the proposition. And of course, I would share that my poem framework, which by now you should all be familiar with, is a good assessment tool. It's a very, very quick deal. Is there a vision? What's that vision in terms of really coins? All right. All right. What's the pro proposition to the market look like? How's the team look like? Again, what's the economics? And where are they today? Which is what I've laid out when you assess the proposition. Now, next up, what investment stage are they in, okay? Because the question of pre-seed and seed is totally, totally, that's where we play, is totally different, all right, to the first outside money. And you will hear a lot said about seed and angels, which is true. So the definitions will vary depending on who you're talking to and how they're thinking about it. And that is why you will see the diagrammatics here reflect that. But here's what I want to say, okay? For me, there are only two, you know, the only two critical things. First question is, do you have customers? Yes or no? For me, if the answer is no, thank you very much. Please, let's have a chat when you do. Unless it is such a compelling idea with patent in you know an intellectual property and a team to die for etc 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 where you say yeah uh, maybe they start a chance but it'll be one out of a hundred for me in in that case but there are people who still do ideation nothing wrong with it and do quite well Iya Boyeji is one of them um i think uh, olumide is another and like i just mentioned that's why i'm talking to both of them uh tomorrow to understand that and to start around, okay, if, if you are the proponent of it, then um, as a lead investor, what you do is issue a term sheet. These are the terms on which I will lead the round for you there, startup. If you agree, then let me go to my syndicate or to my people and get more money than I have. Or else somebody as a lead investor will share a term sheet with you, or you can co-develop the term sheet to say, this is the basis on which we will do this transaction. But it is dependent on the stage of the startup. Right, next up, we've had this conversation in terms of the different um, investment types. First question is, is it debt or is it equity? My preference, especially with uh, just post MVP startups is convertible debt. Why? Because valuation, you know, is such an issue at that stage. You're not really quite sure what the valuation is. Yes, there are pre-revenue valuation methods, which is how I arrive at the valuation cap. But by that time, I'm doing valuation for evaluation cap, not for equity. And uh, I think by now, everybody here understands the concept of preference shares. Uh, we've talked about safes and why me i'm just anti-safe i don't care what anybody tells me you know everybody's throwing it around i've heard when it starts dropping like fire 
then they will know that Africa is not the place for safes. Um, but in terms of convertible debt, cap convertible debt, my sweet spot is cap convertible debt. Promissory notes I've heard used. Uh, secured promissory notes, then you're becoming a bank. And why do you want to do that? Now, valuation, as I talked about earlier, um, this is from my guy at the top, David. He says, look, forget all the grammar, all right? There are four simple numbers you must know before you invest, all right? You really, really ought to understand it. What is the value of the startup when you invest? And there are methods. We've talked about scorecard. We've talked about Berkers all the way up to First Chicago. There are different ways you can use, okay? Oh, it's right there. Thank you. All right? To, to determine that value, valuation, right? Now, the value of the startup when you sell. Use the forecast figures from the startup. Use industry knowledge. You're supposed to be an expert. You shouldn't be investing outside your industry anyway. So you can gauge, you should be able to gauge the dynamics of the industry you're in and where it is going, okay? Um, once you have that number, how long? Remember I said, is it three years, five years, or seven years, which are the typical numbers uh, that you're looking at? And really, that gives you your rate of return because this is how much I put in, this is how much I'm getting out, this is how long it's taking me to get it out. Guess what? That's your rate of return there. And the bottom line is you multiply the rate of return by the amount you invested, and that is what you get. Like it says, there are other factors such as dilution. Again, you take a percentage hit on that. Um, and in some cases, uh, you even have uh, down rounds. Like uh, where we, it isn't really a down round we've had with Big Kabar, but a flat round where they, you know, they started three years ago and they're still at the same valuation. But you can have situations like that. However, the critical thing is this. The lower the valuation at the beginning, all right, if they do things properly and they do it as you're expecting, then the stronger the returns. And that is why, okay, I went in at five grand in strike and 250 sounded like a lot of money. Whereas for uh, Media 24 that came in at the same, you know, when that, that I actually exited half my shares for that 250, when I got the other 250 last year, guess what they got, okay? About half of what I did in terms of value for, for, for money. So it's a question of where you start with the valuations. That's why valuation is important and why valuation caps on convertible notes are critical. Term sheets, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but you remember economic and controlling conditions and you wanna be sure that they match your thinking and what you're expecting, okay? Um, I think the critical thing there really is making sure that you actually understand what kind of ROI uh, you are getting in a liquidity event and on control conditions, what information rights you have um, is, is probably the most important. You, are, you already understand the different clauses that can be um, in terms of a term sheet, but then you agree the term sheet with, uh, with the founder and that is what the other investors who are co-investing with you, if you're leading the deal, come on board with, or what you are contributing to as a co-investor to ensure that it reflects your reality and your expectations. Once you've agreed the term sheets, well, it's the due diligence just to make sure that the facts are the facts. Um, I don't know if any of you was at the LAN event um, last week, where uh, Yemi Kerry talked about uh, the investment we Nelly made. And they, they did that. Uh, as the way land works is uh, financial and legal due diligence are given to professionals after the, um, the angels have com completed commercial due diligence and are uh, satisfied because the financial and legal are paid for. We incur costs there, so we scrutinize it and do the best we can ourselves to be sure before we send it off for those two things. And in this particular instance, in fact, I still remember 
I brought out my checkbook that day. I'll never forget. And I was like, ah, no, this is just too good to be true. All right, how much? And uh, rising, the Rising Tide Syndicate said, you know, this is a land deal. Let's, uh, let's go take a look at them. And I will tell, and they came back and quite literally, the startup was non-existent. Everything they had told us was fallacious. Everything. But it was an amazing presentation with pictures, with numbers, with, you know. So again, I can't overemphasize what DD does. Financial due diligence, make sure they kick, kick the tires of those numbers, all right? And you'll be amazed at what you find when uh, people take close scrutiny of, of numbers, uh, especially given that most founders are not really financially literate to the extent of the, some of the forecasts they're pushing around. So it's worth definitely, in my opinion, if you're not, if you don't come from a financial background, then it's worth spending the money to get good financial DD. A legal, <laughs> um, there was a startup that we were going to invest in and we got into legal due diligence only to find out that they had anti-dilution clauses in there that were just so draconian it was untrue. Um, Eventually, I made sure the guy got deported, the, you know, because, you know, you can't come to Nigeria and start doing all kinds of nonsense. Um, but, it, it, you know, you'd be amazed at what you find through legal DG, who owns what, you know, um, and are they properly structured? Have they ever had any board meetings, et cetera, et cetera? These are all important things. Who owns the assets? Are there any liabilities? You know, it's not just financial that we, you know, you may find agreements that are on towards they've done in terms of licensing and partnerships. So these are all things that come out of legal due diligence. You've got to make sure you check for if they're not told. Then closing the deal. Well, first thing is jurisdiction and taxation. Uh, increasingly, we're finding Delaware companies uh, along our track. The question becomes, you know, if there's a fallout, whose jurisdiction, if you want to sue, are you going to have to go and sue in America? How are you going to do that? What happens? How about when you make money? Where are you tax liable? Well, if it's a, if it's a U.S. company, guess what? You're going to pay U.S. taxes. So these are considerations you've got to look at in terms of the investing entity. All right? Uh, we all talk about SPV, SPV, SPV. Well, hmm. Where that SPV is based is critically important if you're planning to make big money, okay? I like the UK because it's got EIS and SEIS, but, you know, uh, I've been told there are friendlier jurisdictions for SPVs, but uh, I point to people uh, recently, Paga just packed his bags, you know, out of Mauritius and headed to the UK, saying he found it friendlier, deal with that. Then in terms of legal paperwork, the more standard the things you're doing are, the easier it is to get them through. And the cheaper it really is for everybody um, along. And <laughs> uh, name changes do occur. Let me just put it that way. All right. Whether they become somebody's wife as Mrs. And uh, all the other documentation has their maiden name on it, which can give you issues. Or is some guy who decided that he didn't like uh, the traditional uh, gods being part of his surname and decided to change it to one that was more Jesus friendly. Whatever it is, be sure that who you're dealing with is legally capable of being dealt with. That's where identification comes very important. Then you've got to sign the document itself, you know. Um, in the case of equity, it's the shareholders agreement. In the case of a convertible, it's those purchase agreement. Uh, like they say, uh, the job's not finished till the paperwork's done. So you sign the agreement. And typically, if there are conditions for closing, then what you want to do is escrow the funds with an agreed third party. And then when they meet those conditions, then you release. The reason is it shows good faith. So they know that, yes, if they do what they're supposed to do, they are going to get the money. After the investment, what happens? Well, 
critically you should have in your term sheets. Remember I talked about information rights. So you're getting performance data as frequently as you've asked for it. So you're monitoring their growth and their projections, how they're doing, you know, uh, to it. And you've got to look at your portfolio, you know, as a whole. Um, the best example I can, uh, I can give you is, for example, I, one of my investments is Big Cabal Media. And recently they featured FlexiSelf, which is one of, um, one of my uh, portfolio companies. I'm still talking to them about doing power still, but, you know, I, et cetera. So it's those kind of synergies you're looking for, as opposed to companies that compete against each other. Then in terms of making on follow, follow on investments, um, pay to play is where there's a round that you actually get diluted if you don't participate. Um, and not, dilute, not diluted in terms of number of shares, but diluted in terms of value. So you've got to watch out for that and you know, don't buy into it. The most important thing about portfolio management is adding value to your investment. So you know you can get your money back because the more value you add, the quicker your returns. And that typically means access to the relationships you have business-wise and otherwise. Um, the best example um, I can give you is for, you know, well, um, let me take, um, let me pick, okay, FlexiSelf, for example, okay. Um, FlexiSelf is a, um, is an education software uh, that manages for use for school management. And as they were growing, they got into a situation where some of the schools could not afford okay, the platform in terms of bulk, but we wanted to be paying piecemeal. And their model didn't allow for that. Um, so we, we had an advisory session and I managed, you know, it just dawned on me, well, hang on, I've got in my syndicate, Bumi Lawson. Bumi Lawson runs Edfin, which is an education micro, uh, microfinance bank. Why don't I put the two of you together? And guess what? They've now got a product that allows schools and because of that, they're onboarding schools faster. So those are the kind of value adds you could do for your startups. And it doesn't mean you have to sit on the board of directors. Remember I said most startups fail. Do you really want to be part of a failed company? The only reason you should sit on the board of a startup is if you're going to really add value to that startup by being there or else find somebody else to do that. And if you've got amazing expertise, but it's not operational, then ask for a board of advisor seat. You still get insight and you still get credit for it. But think through properly before you say, ah, I want a board or a seat on the board. After all, I own 3% or 7% or blah, 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 which I hear a lot of. And to me, if you're not adding value to the startup, why do you want to be there? Provide them advisory, okay? It's a better way to go, more elegant, more respectable as far as I'm concerned. Besides, you know, Directors work can be donkey work at times. Now, in terms of measuring progress, um, <clears throat> I again commend you to the POEM framework. You are looking at the market growth rate being positive consistently in terms of the proposition. Now you're looking at the strength of the product or service itself. You're constantly monitoring the competitive advantage they bring to the table and you measure that progress. Same thing. You're looking at the organization. Are they sticking to the entrepreneurial vision? And if it changes and they pivot, how is consistent is it with the direction? Do they have a consistent ability to execute? Are they hiring the right people in? Are they defining the roles and responsibilities correctly? Are they compensating correctly? Do they have access to the right kind of resources, be it financial or otherwise? Then, what kind of revenue strengths you know, are you seeing? Is that growth rate in revenue there? All right, and you don't expect them to be profitable at our stage, but is there credible future profitability on the cards? And then in terms of how they're burning cash today compared to what your expectations are, is it acceptable? Finally, I can't overemphasize constant evaluation of exit routes. How am I gonna get out of this thing? Are they growing fast enough for VC to take it? Are they growing well enough for somebody to buy it? Okay, how feasible is, are they for follow on investments if I don't have the cash? Um, finally, exit value. 
how satisfactory. And you can measure this, you know, in terms of days. I remember when um, uh, Pastor NG started, it was a weekly, I, I asked them for a weekly report on these so that I could help them grow. Um, for others, it may be monthly, it could be quarterly, you know, uh, annually is a bit dodgy, I might add. Right, portfolio diversification. Um, please remember that this is angel investing. It is the most risky asset class known to investors. So what you are looking to do is spread the risk of losses. Okay. And increase the likelihood of getting, you know, something serious back. As we say across, you know, different, I'm talking of, if you don't own property or have a fixed income capable uh, asset, then don't play. In addition, you may want to look at even some other, you know, let me put it this way. First of all, get property, own shares, okay? Look at other asset classes before coming to angel investing, all right? It should not be more than 10% of your overall asset portfolio. Then you will find that it is typically Pareto's rule that obtains here. And that is when you understand exits. And here's what we tend to see. All right. Half of them, forget your money. All right. Um, I don't know if any, no, I don't think anybody here met Femi Akinde, for example. I mean, amazing, amazing individual. The company went bust. Just, you know, couldn't make it. And that was the end of it. Um, Again, when you recognize the fact that half, half, half the, the um, startups go out of business, it's just, that's just the way it is. Because remember, this is, these are innovators using tech-enabled solutions. So it's not everybody, or everybody that's going to win. All right? Most go to sale for larger companies, all right, which is mergers and acquisitions. Acqui hire is when a company buys uh, the, the buys a startup so that it can turn the people in that startup to employees or one unit of, or one department in their in their um, in their company. Um, I know Coca Cola, for example, you know, has done that to a couple of startups. Um, Nestle's also done that. There are others that are doing, you know, acqui hires. Um, Paga did that recently. Then you've got The Walking Dead. You know, I have one of those. Um, it's a real estate start. Well, it's no longer a startup. I call it an SME and he gets annoyed with me. But um, essentially, they're there just to pay salaries. They make enough to keep paying salaries and not, nothing more. Um, soft landing with a competitor. Yep. You know, maybe the competitor buys them out with a share swap. Bought out by later investors, which is VCs, is, yeah, it, it goes, but not as much as you'd like to think. Lifestyle entrepreneur, I haven't seen that yet. Um, a roll-up is when uh, corporate goes on a buying spree to buy multiple uh, startups so that they can get into a particular position, just like um, Max did with uh, some of the... Uh, bike hailing companies that they, they put together. Um, disappears, I've had that happen to me once. Uh, that was, um, oh my God, um, the, the mechanic, um, the mechanic uh, startup, they just disappeared. An IPO, well, you know, hope springs eternal um, that InterSwitch one day will IPO. But um, that's, that's sort of the profile. Um, and that is why you've got to consider your exit strategy before you invest, not after you've invested. Okay. Before you go in, you've got to think, how do I get out? And when do I get out? And saleability is the key. So you're looking at corporate fit 
and their future cash flow. Those are two critical things I can't overemphasize. And that's why I was talking about financial due diligence, revealing all kinds of things. And in terms of strategic corporate fit, you've got to look at the ability of these founders to actually develop a culture that makes them acquirable. So those are the kind of things that go around exits because we still don't have any reliable data, okay? Um, my, my guy, uh, God, he works for me now, Maxim Bayan, um, is exceedingly good at monitoring all the investments that have come into Africa, but he's looking at those that have done investments over half a million and a million dollars. So um, we've not got at our stage um, data, which I am hoping I'm working with another um, a young, young man by the name of uh, Adewale Yusuf. Um, who's running TechPoint. He's actually doing a round, if anybody's interested, um, to who's sitting on a gold mine of uh, those the data uh, on that front. Right. Well, yeah, actually, this is where we all want to get to, is that liquidity event. All right. Um, although it's rarely, like I said, a public offering, but the exit is when, you know, anybody with an ex equity position can get some cash. That's, that's really what we're talking about here. Whether they're being bought or it's an acquihire, whatever reason. Um, but we have to have the reality that, like I said earlier, 50% of these guys fail. So you've got to prepare for both occurrences. That, that is the point I'm trying to make here. You've got to be prepared for either, well, yes, they've made money and this is how we're going to divvy it up. And I'll talk about that at all. Guess what? Sorry, oh. <laughs> we're folding up. And I've been in both situations. Now, the key thing is, when a startup fails, what happens? Well, you have to understand convertible notes will come before equity. But by and large, it means nothing if it's a bankruptcy or fire sale. Because what you're going to get either way is a percentage of your investment. If you're lucky, if the, when the entrepreneur is starting his next company, he'll give you a small grant of uh, shares to say, okay, I'm starting again, please, can you help? But by and large, when they fail, that's what tends to happen. But when they're acquired, aha. Well, I've seen, I've had one acquisition that was a share swap. So we went from being big fish, uh, at that time, I think we were like 30 something percent of the company. We'd grow to that because I was actually acting MD at a time uh, for the company to where we became owners of less than 10% of a global entity. Um, so it can be shares, it can be cash, or it can be both. And when it is cash, then you want to understand the payout sequence. Debt always comes first. So if, you know, Convertible notes convert at that point, so they're not treated as debts, they're treated as common stock. Preferred will get their money first, or because you're trying, they, in, pref, in preference shares, they're guaranteed returns. So they collect that and collect it. Then what is left is what the common stock divides. I've been in one situation where the preference share guys beat their lips when they saw what was left, they wept because they thought that our ah, 5X was a lucrative deal. And then the common stock guys walked away with something like about 25, 30X on average. So you've got to weigh, weigh your options when you're writing those term sheets and exactly, you know. And then guess what? Once it's done, you revisit your investment thesis. What are you trying to achieve? What's the portfolio objective? How are you going to evaluate investments? How do startups fit? What type of growth opportunities are you looking for post-investment? What should their financial performance look like? What risks are you willing to accommodate or mitigate? What internal rate of return are you expecting on your investment? And what exit strategies are you looking to buy into? How much are you going to invest? And how many rounds are you going to do? Just like at the beginning. So you revisit your investment thesis and guess what? You start all over again. Lady and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, guess what? I did it on the hour. We've now got enough time. 
to have a conversation about what you've just heard. Thank you very much for listening.